Hello everybody, what a week it's been for One Piece. Bunch of news and reveals. We're gonna go over all of that stuff here, starting with Film Red. A new trailer was revealed during the week that shows us that apparently Luffy and Uta knew each other from way back when. So this is kind of like a Sabo situation where Luffy's relationship to Sabo was introduced pretty late into the story via flashback. Now it could be that maybe this is all an hallucination. Maybe Uta is using her powers to make Luffy believe that they already knew each other. But if it is the case that they knew each other back then, I'm pretty sure that Uta must have heard Luffy declare his real dream, right? Just like Shanks did. So Uta probably knows what Luffy's secret dream is. In fact, Uta's goal in the trailer seems to be related to Luffy's goal, which I think is to bring out world peace so that everybody gets along. Except she seems to be using her powers to manipulate people into doing so. Now because of the wording that Oda used in his statement that was released this week, which we'll talk about later, I can't imagine this film being a hundred percent filler or non-canon. I've said this from the very beginning, but because of the timing of this movie and because of the subject matter of this movie, there has to be some degree of canon material in this film. We're too far in for this to be 100% filler, especially with Oda saying that we're entering the final stage after the break and that he wants to take the time to be able to make the right adjustments so that he can guide us to the finish line. We got a movie poster as well that has Oda as the general producer of the film, as well as the one responsible for the original story of the movie. So with that in mind, and given the fact that he said that he just wants to be able to finish the story, I don't think he would be spending so much time and energy on a project that wasn't in some way, shape, or form connected to the canon manga. And so with that in mind, I noticed that in the trailer, there's a scene where Uta's wings turn dark, just like King's wings are. And so maybe we'll get more lore about Lunarians in this movie. This week the cover shows us a character that we haven't seen since Capone gave him back his heart and allowed him to be free again in Whole Cake Island. Of course I'm talking about Mr. Gangster Gastino himself, Caesar Clown. We see him running into the Vince Smokes, which I guess means that he will be escaping along with them because during the tea party they were both kind of on the same side, the Vince Smokes and, and Caesar. So they kind of helped each other out. So I, I don't think that they would be too resistant in terms of him joining them. Plus, Caesar actually has a power past connection to Judge. They knew each other in the past. And so this could be a lead in to them interacting and us getting more information about their past scientific group called MADS. And as we know, members of MADS included Vegapunk, Queen, Caesar himself, and Judge. Now I'm gonna be using this bit of information later in the video to make a point, but I have to mention that according to a Vivri card, before this chapter came out, Caesar had actually escaped Whole Cake Island. Also, since Oda's gonna be taking a four week break after next week's chapter, I think it would be a really good idea to use next week's cover page to reveal who the actual intruders were in Whole Cake Island. The actual chapter starts off with the Gorosei expressing shock at the news that Nika has made his return. Wow, if only they had done something about a pirate with rubber powers that was storming their facilities like Enius Lobby, Impel Down, and Marineford two years ago, maybe they wouldn't be in this situation. Then again, it's not like the Gorosei knew that the Nika Nika no Mi would grant the user the properties of a rubber body or anything, right? Oh. We get one panel with this guy talking about how Kaido and Big Mom have been defeated, but Oda doesn't really show us what happened to the two Yonko or their crews, so I guess we'll just have to wait more to find out. Sunisha's arrival in Wano ended up being completely pointless, because all the elephant did was say a couple of words about having faith and believing in Joy Boy, and then they just turned around and left. I kind of get the impression that this chapter was full of last minute changes that were included just to be able to wrap things up as soon as possible. Because I do think that Oda's initial intention was to open up the borders of Wano by the end of the arc. But then there was like a corporate meeting in Shueisha or some kind of a staff meeting and he was told not to so he had to change his plans. Because just having Sunisha there to show up and leave makes no sense and it's very unlike Oda. So the elders say that they can't take over Wano, they can't invade right now because Wano is a natural fortress, but they also say that they still want Robin, which is interesting because Robin is nowhere in the chapter. So I'm sure that we'll get to see Robin in the next chapter deciphering the Poneglyphs. So maybe we'll finally get some information on Uranus next chapter. Then again, we clearly see that somebody hijacks the signal of the world government Denden Mushi. At first I thought it was Green Bull who was doing this, but then I realized that this, this sequence is actually taking place seven days prior to Green Bull's arrival. I feel like it has to be somebody within Wano at this point. Probably a Poo or Caribou, somebody like that. All right, now let's talk about the Hawkins scene, because I think it's both good and strange at the same time. There's two sides to it. It's good because it means that if this is Hawkins' final scene, which I'm pretty sure that it is, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure he's dead after this scene. Uh, if this is his final scene, that means that there was some character growth 
uh, at least a little bit of character development, because it means that for once in his life, Hawkins did something that went against his cards. Uh, he acted against the probability that the cards were showing him. So that's good for, for character growth. Now, the reason why it's strange is because when you have a fight, and especially a fight in Shonen, a fight is not just a clash between two powers. It's not just a clash of strength. It's also a clash between two ideologies. So do you guys remember what the lesson was that Killer was sort of trying to teach Hawkins throughout that fight? Do you remember what, what, what was being said during that fight? Because what I remember was that Hawkins kept saying, you're not going to win. Give up. You're not going to win. The odds are against you. I've predicted your outcome and it's not, it's not looking good. So give up. That's what Hawkins was saying. And Killer was saying, it doesn't matter. At some point, you have to pick a side and keep fighting no matter the odds. That's what I thought Killer was trying to teach Hawkins. But as it turns out, Hawkins already knew that. He knew that throughout his entire fight with Killer. He was just pretending, or he was just essentially like lying to Killer, saying that he was still acting in accordance with the cards. So in a way, both characters actually agreed with each other throughout that entire fight. It's just that Hawkins didn't want to admit that he had made a mistake. Unfortunately, Professor Sarah Hebby won't be coming back this semester to teach her normal class. She was caught selling drugs out in the parking lot. No, she actually got defeated alongside Black Maria. So now the kids could be re-educated or indoctrinated with something else. We go around Wano and we see that the people of Ibizu Town now have access to purified, clean water, just like Shogun Momonosuke promised. We also see that the citizens have access to the Paradise Farm and its resources. So I'm pretty sure that they're getting that food out to prepare for the party. That big party that was promised before the beginning of the raid, I'm pretty sure it's going to be taking place next chapter. And after that, we see that Oda's perpetual tendency to have Luffy hog the spotlight continues. Nothing new here. So there's a comparison between Luffy and Ryuma in terms of their heroic acts in protecting Wano. Apparently, Izo and Ashura Doji passed away. Um... <laughs> I um I felt those deaths, you know, they were so impactful when they happened. <laughs> no, seriously, this feels like a last minute fix. This feels like somebody told Oda, hey, people are saying, people are complaining that you're not killing enough characters. And Oda's like, well, let me just patch that up real quick. I'm just going to say that these two died. Ashura Doji was supposed to be one of the strongest scabbards because like he was the one who fought Odin 1v1. And it took Odin a whole day to be able to deal with him. But apparently a bomb was enough to kill him. And then Izo died to a Shigan. Now granted you could say, yeah, but both of them fought Kaido. And they were badly injured. Well, Kinemon fought Kaido. Kinemon got busted in the head like a whack-a-mole from Kaido's club with Conqueror's Hockey. And then he got stabbed in half after that. And he still survived. And I honestly don't think that Kinemon would have been able to hold his own against Odin the same way that Ashura did. The only way you can say that these two deaths were impactful is to say that they were impactful in retrospect. Because when the events that led to these deaths actually were happening, nobody actually believed that these two characters would die. And this is partly due to the fact that Oda rarely kills characters. And when he does, he, he's pretty good usually at creating a context that makes the death impactful. We have Ace's death, for example, or Whitebeard's death. Heck, even Pedro's death felt like there was some pretty good lead up to that sacrifice. Some people still have their doubts about whether Pedro is actually dead, but it's more believable that he's dead because of the context and the lead up to the moment of his death. Another thing is that due to the seven day time skip, we don't really get to see any of the characters really grieve and mourn the loss of Ashura and Izo. So I think a really good idea for next chapter would be for us to get a little bit of a flashback as to what it was that happened during those seven days that we skipped. I think getting a flashback of those past seven days would really help fill in some of the gaps, some of the holes. Also, I've said this recently, but I think it'd be a cool idea to give Izo's flintlocks his pistols to Usopp, you know, for Usopp to inherit those pistols and use them in honor of Izo because, you know, he was kind of fulfilling Izo's wish of saving Kinemon and Kiku. There's still that open plot point with Zoro going to Ryuma's grave and also him figuring out how to forge a black blade. So I'm sure he's going to be going back to Ringo for that and meet up with Onimaru. And they're also going to be placing Odin, Yasui, and the daimyo that passed away in that same place as well. So if that's the case, then I'm sure that Zoro will come across Shimotsuki Ushimaru and hopefully that opens up the door 
door for us to get more Shimotsuki lore. Anyway, Kinemon goes on to say that he doesn't think he would be able to handle anything else happening to the remaining heroes. So maybe Kinemon can share some of his gratuitous plot armor with them. Marco is there as well, and I was reminded of the moment where he showed up in Wano to kick the Big Mom pirates out of the sky. Remember when he said, next time you guys make it up here, we'll be in a new age, we'll be in a different era. So I'm hoping that line still pays off to some degree. Again, I do think it's important that we get at least some information about what happened in Wano during the past seven days, because there was recently a massive volcanic eruption that took place. We then cut to Yamato fasting, and we later find out from Jimbei that it's tradition from the people of Wano to give up something to fast in order for their prayers to be answered. And I find that fascinating because in Green Bull's introduction, we find out from Fujitora that Green Bull has been fasting. Green Bull says that he hasn't eaten anything for three years, but that he would break his fast, that he would actually eat something if a nice lady, if a beautiful woman fed him or helped him out. So to me, that means that maybe he's been fasting because he wants to find a girlfriend. Like he's given up food until he finds a lady. And I think the reason why he's able to do that, like go years without eating, is because his devil fruit power allows him to get the nutrients he needs via photosynthesis, just like a plant would. So there's pretty much no reason to have that scene with Yamato fasting and then Jimmy explaining the reason for it, unless it's to confirm that Green Bull is also from Wano. I didn't think we were gonna get this, but we actually did get the Hiori dropkick on Momonosuke, which I thought was great. We also find out that the justification for Momo's perviness has run out because Nami reacts pretty violently towards his approach. Sanji and Brooke are happy about this because it means there's some justice in this world. I honestly thought that there was some pretty good art throughout this part of the chapter. I thought the scene of Yamato putting a plate on Momo's head was pretty endearing and funny and, and just sweet. Like it was, it was a very sweet scene. And I also really like the scene where Luffy and Zoro turn around as they're eating and drinking with Chopper on Zoro and Yamato on Luffy because it reminded me of how this whole arc started you know with with the duo together and them going off on a mini adventure apparently Hiori still kind of has a thing for Zoro because she was pretty happy to be able to clean his body throughout the seven days so of course this infuriates Sanji to no end and I knew that him asking Zoro to kill him if he lost his emotions was going to come back and be turned into a gag somehow it's just too much of a golden opportunity for Zoro not to milk it also apparently Zoro went to hell <laughs> and he came back I mean he did say he was going to become the king of hell, so I guess the Grim Reaper was real. Also in One Piece this week, Oda decides to make the progressive choice of having Yamato refuse to go into the girls' bathroom and instead venture into the boys' bathroom. Join me as we explore the absolute cluster this debate has caused within the One Piece community. No, but in all seriousness, with this chapter, specifically with, with uh, these set of panels, I think it's, it's pretty obvious that Oda has now made a choice. He's made a decision. Uh, he's very clearly picking a side in regards to the Yamato gender debate. I think it's a very deliberate choice by Oda to have both Yamato and Kiku in the same panel, right? Um, in the same scene, essentially, and then have a panel with the boys' bathroom and then a panel with the girls' bathroom back to back. Now with Kiku's case, Oda was very clear from the start, pretty early on. Like we got an explanation in Udon, we sort of absorbed that information and we said, okay, this is what it is. And I think for the most part, everybody moved on. We accepted it because it was clear, direct, and concise. Now with Yamato, it's been different because there's been a a pretty long, arduous back and forth. Now the panels that we get in this chapter, I think the best way that I could describe them is that they're very inclusive. And one of the things that makes the boys bathroom panel so inclusive is that we see Brooke and Sanji reacting like Brooke and Sanji. In fact, Sanji's reaction to Yamato in this panel is a straight up replica of the reaction that he has when he sees Nami and Robin after the time skip. He just skyrockets away with a nosebleed. So there is that hint of gray there because as we, as we know historically, if we look at the characters of Brooke and Sanji, both of them have been depicted as being very clearly straight. I like how in the panel where the whole bathroom topic comes up, you literally have Sanji and Zoro fighting in the background. Like Oda knew that this was gonna be controversial and that this was gonna cause a fight. Another thing that I think is very intentional is that Oda decided to give us this scene this month. I think it's definitely a pride thing, you know? I think that's pretty obvious. In the beginning of the video, I said that I was gonna be making a point about the Vivri cards. So if you watched my review for, I think it was 1050, I actually made a point about how Oda like made it a point in that chapter to amend a Vivri card, right? Because in that chapter, we find out that Yasui actually ate a smiley, uh, a smile devil fruit, when in fact, one of the Vivri cards actually said that he did not. And as I mentioned in the beginning of the video, uh, one of the Vivri cards said 
that Caesar had successfully escaped Holgeic Island. And as we find out in, in the cover of this chapter, it turns out that that's not the case, that in fact, the opposite is the case. So I'm just gonna share with you what my interpretation of Yamato was up until this chapter, okay? Just so we're clear. So imagine that you're at a convention. Let's say that you're at San Diego Comic-Con or whatever. And this girl is dressed up as Batman, right? And she keeps saying, I'm Batman, I'm Batman. Maybe has like a batarang or something. She's hanging around with her friends that are uh, dressed up as Justice League members. So she's role playing, she's, she's pretending to be Batman, right? She's having a lot of fun. Now at the end of the day, at the end of the convention, when it comes to this person deciding what bathroom to use, right? I thought, or this, this was my assumption, I thought that this girl would put away the Batman persona, would, you know, maybe take off the mask and decide to go into the girl's bathroom. That's what I thought Yamato would do up until this chapter. Today, Oda is very clearly saying that that's not the case when it comes to Yamato. Because the situation and because the back and forth has been very messy and has been very confusing, and, and I don't think it needed to be as messy and as confusing as it got. I honestly do hope that this panel ends up doing some good. And, and I mean some genuine good, not, not just some superficial, surface level, pat yourself on the back sort of good, but some genuine good. Uh, I hope it does some genuine good for people. Because at the end of the day, when it comes down to it, as human beings, th there's two things that I know for sure when it comes to human beings, whether they're male or female. And that's the fact that Everybody on this earth suffers. We all experience emotional pain. That's number one. And number two is that we all have a need to belong. One of the things the research says about people like Yamato, uh, I read this a while back, but one of the things that the research says is that people like Yamato, whether they decide to go through the reassignment procedure or not, they really benefit from having a strong support system. So that's what the panel is showing, that Yamato has a strong support system. Now, I don't have a support system that's that strong, honestly, you know? Uh, and that's because, you know, I, I'm very bitter. I'm just disappointed about everything. And I hate people and I hate myself. So in a way, Yamato is luckier than I am. So I'm gonna tell you guys what I'm gonna do, okay? If the debate still continues after this, right? And if you guys support me on Patreon, which I don't have because I don't like asking people for money. But if you guys support me on my non-existent Patreon, after the break, I'm going to have J.K. Rowling and Elliot Page here, and we're going to get very drunk, and we're going to have a very civil, interesting, provocative discussion about these topics. So make sure you subscribe to my Patreon, which does not exist. So the ships of the three supernova captains are apparently ready to sail. The Frankie Shogun has also been fixed up, because if you remember, that one suffered some damage from Big Mom. But honestly, I just look at that little drawing of Usopp as he's drinking a cup of coffee or something next to Mina Tomo, and I just get sad. I get sad because he really didn't have much to do this arc. Apparently Kid gave up on wanting to kill Apu for betraying him, just like he gave up on wanting to kill Kaido. So again, they must have patched things up during the past seven days. Now to me it makes a lot of sense that Apu may have some connection to Morgan's or at least might be working for him to some degree because like Morgan's actually says, I'm a DJ of words and Apu is a DJ. So to me, I just made that connection like several chapters ago. And so apparently we're gonna be getting some new titles and bounties next week. I'm I'm curious about the language. In the Japanese, does, does the Pooh say New Yonko? Are there still four emperors? Or could there be more or less than four now? Because Luffy has already been recognized as an emperor in the newspaper. He's called the fifth emperor. So it's not like he can be called emperor again. Like that wouldn't be news anymore. And Luffy got the title of emperor after he took down a first YC. So I'm wondering if Zoro is gonna be able to get that title because he took down a first YC here as well. I know that people have been making predictions slash jokes about how funny it would be if Buggy was named an emperor. What's interesting about that though is that in the anime episode where we find out that Buggy is a Shichibuke, he actually says that he'll become a Yonko in a few years. So I'm wondering if this statement is actually gonna have like an Usopp effect and actually be true. Now, if it were up to me, the people that I would sort of choose to, to become the new emperors would be Weevil because we haven't seen him in a long time and we know he's super strong and he was fighting the Marines the last time we saw him. Kid and Law maybe because they took down a Yonko together. I wonder if Kid and Law's new bounty is going to be Big Mom's bounty but split in half 
you know, half for each, and then maybe give the final spot to Mihawk as an emperor, and then that way we can finally find out what Mihawk's bounty is. Now when it comes to the actual numbers of the bounties, my main point of interest is whether or not Luffy's bounty will surpass Shanks' bounty. Because honestly, I think it has to be either equal or higher than Shanks's at this point. And that'll be the thing that kind of leads into Luffy fulfilling the promise, right? Becoming a great pirate and being able to return the hat to Shanks, or at least being in a position of, my bounty's higher than yours, have it back and then maybe Shanks will say just keep it. And because of the timing maybe that whole thing leads us into film red. Because after Whole Cake Island Shanks read the newspaper and he said I think I'll see you soon Luffy. So them meeting up again has to be coming up very very soon. Probably at the beginning of this new and final saga that was announced this week. I remember Akainu getting pretty upset about Luffy being called the fifth emperor and he was like cut the crap like I gotta take care of this. So he probably read the news and he was like Green Bull get on this go to Wano because this is a mess. I like how Green Green Bull sort of continues the pattern of the admirals of having an interesting mode of transportation with a flower acting as a propeller because Aokiji used to ride his bike on the sea and then I think Kizaru the first time we saw him he was like on a cannonball and then Fujitora can just make things float. I also read some pretty interesting speculation about Green Bull potentially using his devil fruit power to restore the vegetation and crops of Wano. So that way, just like Luffy promised, the people of Wano won't go hungry anymore and they'll be able to eat as much as they want because of Green Bull's devil fruit power. Oda appeared to be very enthusiastic about taking a break because in the translation I read, he was told by the editors, Oda Sensei, do you mind taking a break? And he was like, yes, please. The last time we had a break this long, four week break, was during the time skip. It was right around the time where I had gotten into One Piece, like just, just right before the time skip. So, you know, it brings back memories of like the rumors and the theories and what was going to happen. So there's also some interesting bit of language in the announcement. Oda says, I want to fix up the structure for the final saga of the story so I can tighten it up as soon as possible. So to me, that sounds like he's saying that there are things that he needs to change and adjust from the final saga for it to be not as long. I do think that this chapter is full of last minute adjustments, which kind of goes along with what he's saying in the statement that he, he's been making these adjustments because he wants the story to end as soon as possible, or maybe he wants to end it sooner than he thought he wanted to end. There were definitely things in this chapter that did not feel organic, uh, didn't feel natural to the way that I'm used to Oda writing. The one that stands out to me the most is definitely Sunisha, the giant elephant just suddenly disappearing into the mist, right? Like with one line, that's all we get, one line of explanation. And if that's the case, then like, what was the point of the elephant coming to Wano in the first place, you know? Just to, just to hype Luffy up. So I'm really glad that Oda's gonna be taking a break because that way he has time to relax and to plan things out, uh, you know, as meticulously as he's used to for the final saga. That being said, I have some good news and I have some bad news for you guys. The bad news is, is that I won't be here next week. Uh, I won't be able to upload a review because I scheduled a trip for next week because typically it's always been three chapters, well recently it's been three chapters and a break, three chapters and a break. So we've gotten three chapters in a row already and I thought that we were gonna go on break after this one. So I, I planned a trip uh, about a month and a half ago and everything's booked and, and I can't cancel any of those reservations. So I won't be here next Sunday, but I will be back the following week. And since there are no chapters, you know, I can use that time to talk about everything that's been going on. I do apologize, but this announcement definitely came out of the blue for me. And I never expected there to be four chapters in a row. Now there is going to be content coming out during the break. Uh, it's the Road to Laugh Tale. It'll be a booklet that contains Oda's manuscripts. So I'm guessing that this will be full of plot points that Oda was not able to incorporate into the actual arc of Wano due to time reasons. Now if I had to guess about what's going to be in the next chapter, I think I was able to come up with like seven plot points that, that would need to be addressed. Uh, within the following chapter. So the first one is the bounties, obviously. Uh, the second one is whether or not Yamato is going to join the crew or not. Uh, third one is Robin and the Red Poneglyph situation. So Robin and the Red Poneglyph. The fourth one is Green Bull's appearance. So that's four. Uh, another one is what happened to Kaido and Big Mom. So that would be five. And then the last two would be uh, Zoro going to Ryuma's grave. And then the last one was, uh, what was the last one? Um, 
Shoot. The party, the party, the, the, the giant party that you know we were uh, expecting to have. So those are the plot points that should be a part of 1053. I was gonna add, uh, I don't know if Chopper is gonna do something about the smiley effects uh, to cure people from, from laughing about everything. Uh, I'm not sure if that's going to be incorporated into next week's chapter. And then I also don't know if Kinemon is going to reunite with his wife, although technically we were told that Otsuru had, had died, had perished. Uh, but we don't know if, if she's actually dead or not. So those two plot points might be addressed next week. They might not. So, uh, But I do think that the must-haves are the seven the seven plot points that I already talked about. That's going to do it for me today, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for all of your support. Even if we disagree at times, just I want you to know that I, I really do appreciate your, your viewership. I hope you guys enjoy 1053. Take care, and I'll catch you guys later. Bye.